Okay, so we're going to continue with those new scientific evidence for the cerebrospinal fluid. Do you remember in the brain, the central nervous system, you have arteries, veins, but you have as well cerebrospinal fluid, and we talk about it, interstitial fluid, so cerebral interstitial fluid, CIF, if you want cerebral extra cellular fluid. And we have some lymph in the PI, in the dura, in different places, but not too much yet discovered inside the brain, except we talk about new discovery in along the large sinus of the brain that we knew for a few years but has been really confirmed. So we talk about this hypothesis of secretion of the CSF, circulation, a circle, is that really a circle? Is that circulation? Is that really a circle, like artery and veins reabsorbed? It could be, or sometimes we call it fluctuation and reabsorption of the CSF. Well, do you remember the conclusion we had? You were a bit shocked, is that Wow, the end of the word as you knew it, that was a little bit different. Well, why is it so wrong? Because the cortex side, this is a threshold point of view, are produced 60 to 85 percent are produced by the cortex side, right? But they still mention in the threshold hypothesis that we have there's another place, another location for the secretion of the CSF. Where would, that, where, would, where would that be? Anybody knows? Where can it be secreted beside the cortex side? They also mention the arteries, the endothelium of the, the arteries of the brain, inside the brain itself. Okay? So, cortex side, where did you get this idea of secretion of the CSF within the cortex side. Remember, we, I told you, we go through the experiment that has been done, the conclusion we extracted from those, maybe there's something wrong from the beginning. Who discovered these, we talk about this secretion to the cortex side, is Dandy in 1919. Dandy was a, a famous scientist, so he got some uh, strength, some, uh, some weight. He, if you want, he closed the foramen of Monroe uh, on one side of uh, uh, the, cord, uh, the ventricle of a dog, and he realized that when he closed that, that foramen Monroe, the ventricle on this side hypertrophy gets bigger. So he said that, wow, if it gets bigger, that's probably because of the cortex side inside this ventricle secrete but the CSF cannot escape because it closed the first escape from the lateral ventricle, which is the uh, foramen of Monroe. Not Marilyn Monroe, uh, just from Monroe. Mm -hmm. And so he decided, wow, that's what happened. You close that side, you can't, CSF cannot escape. Hypertrophy of the ventricle on this side, not on the other. He did that experiment in one single dog. And that was never reproduced. No team was able to reproduce exactly the same experiment. <clears throat> One single dog. Because of that experiment, we decided in the case of hydrocephaly, the kids you know, with a lot of you know, hydrocephaly fluid in the ventricle, we will get rid of the choroid plexi to stop hypersecretion in the lateral ventricle. We're gonna do what we call plexectomy. And for 20, 30 years, we've done plexectomy, removing the choroid plexi, and we stopped today. It's not such a successful surgery. It doesn't work that well. Why wouldn't it work if you take both choroid plexi? So this is an experiment that has been done over and over and over on animals, especially on cats. They insert a cannula inside the aqueduct of Silvius of the cat, right? 
And the are all kind of precaution, especially not to create inflammation, <coughs> fibrotic tissue, to make it well. There's no leakage anywhere. So how many, uh, and you leave that cannula for two to three hours, two to three hours. How much CSF do you think is recovered after two to three hours? Do you remember how much CSF you secrete per uh, per day in 24 hours? How much CSF you have in the whole system? You have about 120, 250 milliliter of CSF, cerebrospinal fluid, right? And how much you secrete per day? Remember that? Four, five, six hundred milliliter. So you have a turnover. CSF is completely renewed a few times a day. Okay, so let's say you have <coughs> 600 milliliter of CSF in 24 hours, it's a pretty high number. In just to make it easy, 12 hours will be 300, six hours would be 150, 75 milliliter in three hours. Okay, so in an hour and two, you should have certain amount that come through the cannula and in inside the tube. Do you know how much they recovered in two to three hours waiting for the CSF to be produced and go inside this tube? Zero. When you connect with them, email them, they, say they see a, a, a drop moving at the end of the catheter, never to drop into the tube. The net Ultrafiltrate. Some is secreted, some is reabsorbed, but at the end, the net ultrafiltrate is zero. Not a drop of CSF produced and dripping inside the tube. That is shocking. Animal after animal after animal. Why wouldn't you have anything inside that tube after three hours? Do we have to rethink our model? So we continue, and then when we look inside the literature, Ah, so this is a CSF produced in the tube. Nothing has been recovered. And so that's why they put the catheter uh, inside an animal in the uh, aqueduct of Silvius, between the third and the fourth ventricle. The CSF pressure in the lateral ventricle and systolic magna did not change during the experiment. There's no hypertrophy. And they concluded that we have to look maybe somewhere else for secretion of CSF, somewhere else than the cereflex site, is a choroidplex site. And if you remove both choroidplex site in monkey and in human, there is no change whatsoever in the composition and the volume of CSF secreted in a day. No change in volume and composition of CSF in human and monkey whatsoever if you remove both correct side. So what's going on? There's something else we're missing, right? So the endothelium, the blood capillary themselves inside the whole brain also secrete CSF. And rather than thinking it's only 10 or 15% of the production of CSF, now we think the, it's a majority of the CSF, the cerebral fluid, that is produced constantly, entirely, at the same time, within your whole brain. Interesting, no? Transport, we said, well, it flow unilaterally from the lateral ventricle to the third and the fourth ventricle, right? Well, that's when you inject a heavy molecule, radioactive, the big heavy molecule will follow those linear pathways. But the CSF is made up of mainly what? CSF is made up of water, 98.5%. The lymph is about 96% water, and the blood would be 
water. CSF 98.5, so this water, where does it go? Where does it go? If you use tritium, which is a, a, a heavier water that you mark, the water is going everywhere, up and down, left and right, reach away from the third, from let's say the fourth to the third to the lateral ventricle, and through the membrane of the ventricle. Those, this ventricle is not a tight compartment. The worm is going through all the time, in and out. They are shocked to see that. The worm is going everywhere, in every direction. It doesn't have to go linearly from the lateral ventricle to the third. It goes absolutely everywhere. Yeah? So if you use a larger molecule, and a heavier molecule, you could find this linear flow, but not when you look at the comportment of the water in this uh, ventricular system. So the second hypothesis is also not clear. It's not the same. And um, finally, if we go to reabsorption, classically we said the cortex sites secrete and reabsorb some of their own composition, like in the kidney that secrete and reabsorb some of its own uh, urine. Um, we have that in the cortex site. And that's totally possible. Do you remember the lymphatics I mentioned are also an important pool of reabsorption, as well as the um, villi and granulation. This is a classical model. Well, this time, if the brain secrete everything, it's also probable that it's going to reabsorb most of everything everywhere in the extracellular compartment within the central nervous system and the brain, especially. You see how it's going to change our model? And also, you're going to have a chance to palpate things a little bit differently, staying open to new possibilities. All right? All right. Just hope you're not being shocked by all this. These are the new uh, um, meningeal um, lymphatics that uh, we discovered recently. We'll talk about that later. Um, we talk about the lymphatic system. We're going to work with those because they are very important. Uh, it's, a, it's a fluid that um, uh, behaves a little bit differently than in the other compartments. It's like sl slower and uh, very important to feel, if you have a patient, the level of toxicity. If you have something that accumulates within the brain, a long-term medication, something irritating the system, it could be a, a dye from the food, it could be a dye from, you know, red dye, yellow dye, sometimes I toxic, uh, green dyes. Could be inhaling uh, uh, some toxic agent. You could find that in those lymphatic system where they try to recover and have a sense uh, to tell the patient uh, not to be exposed to that product or that food or that, you know, uh, whatever substance it is. So it's very interesting to feel those, those uh, clearance pathways. And finally, there's one thing, and that's one of the rare things I did, and I could not have any scientific explanation. I used to um, uh, work and feeling that sometimes the fluid, extracellular fluid of the brain itself, so the brain, parenchyma, the fluid of the brain itself, extracellular fluid, would drain toward the ventricle. Remember I said there is not a very tight hermetic compartment within the ventricle? You could have fluid going from in the ventricle outside in the brain and from the brain toward the ventricle. But if you pay attention, you have a, a slight circulation going from the brain towards the ventricle. And you need to have this circulation happen. And I was teaching that without having the clear understanding of what is the physiology, the mechanism behind it. Just like you know, at the beginning, we sold a lot of aspirin because it worked, but we didn't have the explanation of why it works. Everybody knows that, right? They discovered the prostaglandins <coughs> later, much later, before we knew exactly how it works, we're using aspirin. Well, I was doing the same, but we discovered now that there is, uh, in monkeys especially, that there is a clearance system, that uh, a path that go from the brain to the um, uh, ventricle of the brain, and I'll uh, give you the, the exact uh, a quote if you are interested. It's an article that, uh, one, uh, that uh, was published 
about a year ago, a year and a half ago. So let's work on these different um, uh, fluid in the lymphatic system, the brain compartments. So we are now with the fluid system. We're not with the membrane, we're not with the bone, we're not with the cortex, we're not with the white matter. We're working with the fluid compartment within the brain, see how they behave. And it's, it's fabulous to be, it's an honor to be able to touch someone's um, fluid like this. It's something very, we have to be very respectful and have a, a non-invasive touch when we touch the fluid. Again, for example, the, an autistic child or a child that would not like to be touched would often really like to be touched in their fluid compartment or baby, as you can imagine, or even an animal. They would like to be touched in their fluid compartment, a dog or uh, a horse. And autistic, autistic child, once they trust you with a touch, will also like to be compressed. They like to have a heavy touch later on, but don't start with that. First start with a fluid, gentle fluid touch, and that will be able to go into something heavier if they need it. But this is very important to understand how this will move, how you can connect with them, and how it can affect your own fluid too. When you work on your patient, and it's something very uh, beautiful to feel, okay? So let's work on that and go uh, to our demo table, okay? Thank you.